All right, let's talk about monitoring your mixes. All right, so this video is just going to be a bit of an informal chat about monitoring in general, what I've learned about monitoring, what I do for monitoring, that kind of thing. So first of all, monitoring your mix, all that is is listening to your mix, right? It's, it's what we do as we work on something, as we check on it to make sure that we like it. Um, it just means listening to your mix. And so one thing that we do very often is that we listen to our mixes in different locations, especially if you don't have as much of a tuned room. So if you're working in something like a home studio, I would definitely recommend spending more time listening to your mix in different locations. If you're in a very well calibrated studio that you've known for years, then you might not feel the need to do it as much. I've become, as I've developed this space that I'm in, I have had to check my mixes less often. I've gotten a better idea of what it's going to sound like when it translates to other systems, um, you know, how it's going to translate to other systems. So I don't spend as much time monitoring my mixes in other locations as I used to, right? And I don't worry about it as much as I used to. It's really more me not worrying about it as much as I used to. Um, but with that said, you know, people often have multiple sets of monitors in their studios. So often there are some main monitors. Sometimes they're the big ones that are built into the wall. I'll try to put some B-roll here as I go, as I talk about things. Um, but oftentimes they're like big main mixers that are sometimes built into the studio themselves. Those are often the very expensive ones. They're often, um, you know, much fuller sounding. And then sometimes we have things like the NS10s where they're kind of built to sound bad, so to speak, right? So if they are forgiving to your mix, then your mix is probably in a decent spot. Um, but a lot of people don't like listening to NS10s all the time, right? Be for, for those reasons. So um, those are usually not the only ones that you would see in the studio if they're there. We have things like the Aventone mix cubes, which kind of function similarly to the NS10s, right? So they're kind of there to sound, um, I mean, it's a little different, but like they're kind of there to sound more like a consumer speaker. So if they're forgiving to your music, then, um, you know, you're probably in a decent spot. Um, they're not as full sounding, right? They're littler, they're not as full sounding, but they serve a function because they help you check your mix with a speaker that's, you know, more like a consumer speaker, more like a cheaper speaker, um, one that is less forgiving to your mix, right? So a lot of times in studios, we'll have multiple monitors. And, um, you know, as you work in a studio, you get to know the specific monitors even more. So uh, it's a good idea to switch between whatever you have every so often and have a listen and try to calibrate your brain to what it sounds like. Um, and the more time you spend in a space, you know, your brain is calibrating to that space. So, for example, I know in this space that everything is um, pretty, pretty true, like it translates pretty well to, you know, things in the outside world. But, um, for example, my bass is often a little too loud when I go elsewhere. And that's something that I'll probably try to target next with the upcoming, you know, um, gear purchases or, you know, my next moves to improve my studio. Um, one thing that I think I might be doing soon is getting a sub because, believe it or not, I don't have a sub in here. Um, I probably should have gotten a sub sooner, but, but I do have a good amount of bass in here. So it's not like it's totally lacking. I just know that if I have a sub, this seems kind of counterintuitive to some people, but but if you have a sub, it's going to be easier to hear the low end, right? So then you're more likely to mix with a little bit less low end. So, um, you know, I've seen people at the college where I teach, like, crank the sub in the studio. And I'm like, you're you're actually probably going to end up putting less bass in your in your whatever you're working on because you're cranking the sub so much. So, yeah, with that said, you know, I spent a lot of time and energy on balancing my studio space here. And it's taken me years to get to this point. Right. Um, you know, slowly getting gear and equipment and, and mostly acoustic treatment. Right. And um, moving spaces like two years, almost two years ago now. But I know that in terms of the sound in my room and the space, I do have that weakness with the low end. So I do consciously try to mix with less low end than I think I want or than I think I need so that when I go to check the mix elsewhere, it's more likely to translate nicely. And if that's like the only thing you're worrying about, then maybe that's not so bad. You know, it, it's been working pretty well for me. And, you know, with that said, I do want to talk about the different things that I do when I'm monitoring a mix, when I'm checking a mix. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention in this video somewhere is the idea that you can get software that will calibrate um, the output coming out of your computer 
and it'll calibrate it based on your actual acoustic space. So if your room has like a boost at 100 hertz, it'll add an automatic cut at 100 hertz to try to kind of balance that out and make your uh, response just a little more even, a little more honest. Um, so things like, you can look them up, but things like Sound ID, they're out there. You can try them. This is not a sponsored video, not paid or anything. I just wanted to mention that those exist out there. It's a room calibration software. There's a whole bunch of them. I think IK Multimedia has some too. There, there are a whole bunch of them, so you can look those up. Um, but let's talk about what I do when I'm checking my mix. So here in my studio, I have two sets of monitors. I have some Cali monitors and I have some Mackie monitors. They're both like the eight size model. So they're nothing super fancy, nothing super expensive, but they sound great. The Callies are the ones that I use as my mains. And then the Mackies I've had since undergrad. So um, I'm very familiar with them, which is a big part of why I keep them around. Um, but I do like the Callies a little bit more. They're just a little crisper. And you can do a decent mix with monitors that aren't like insanely expensive. Like, I mean, the expensive monitors are really nice, but a lot of the problems that people are having and they don't realize it is really the acoustic space they're in. So one of the first things I did was I focused on the acoustic space and not so much on getting the expensive monitors because you can have an expensive monitor, you know, making beautiful sound. And if it's bouncing around in a room, that's just like changing everything. It's just going it, to, it can, it can sound awful. I mean, imagine putting a really expensive monitor in a gymnasium to, you know, think of a, an extreme example of that. So, um, you know, it can be nice to get the, the expensive equipment if you can afford it. But if you can't, you should know that it's possible to get a really good mix with, um, with more affordable monitors, with more affordable speakers. So that's what I have, is I have the Callies and then the Mackies. And I'll switch between the two, but I'm primarily working with my Callies. I've really gotten to know them. I've gotten to know them in this space. So I really, um, I trust them and, um, it's been going well so far. So that's what I do. And that's what I do while I'm working. And then once I get to the point where I feel like a mix is close to done, often what I'll do is I'll listen on some headphones first before I bounce out the mix. So I'll have listened on two sets of monitors at this point, primarily on my mains. And then what I'll do is I'll listen on my headphones. So I have some open back headphones here. These are the Sennheiser HD 600, but you can get, you know, there are a whole range of different headphones that you can get. Um, I have a video all about open back versus closed back headphones that I'll put a card for up on the screen and I'll put in the description for you if you're curious about like why I chose open backs um, to have here. Um, but I do have a bunch of other headphones that I'll sometimes plug in and listen to. So I listen in my headphones and that's just to get another another location to listen to, like slightly different set of speakers. And this is also like a little closer to what some people will be listening on, right? So I also have another pair of wireless Bluetooth, like over ear headphones that I'll often listen to a mix. Um, you know, that's often after I actually bounce the mix out. I will then listen like, you know, using my phone with the wireless headphones down in the house, for example, while I'm grabbing a snack or something. So um, I'll listen on these. And then I'll also listen on these. So these are Sony Walkman headphones. They're actually from an original Sony Walkman. Um, it's one of the old metal ones from, I believe, the 80s or 90s. Um, a friend gave these to me. They were hanging out in a monastery on a shelf, and he brought them to me. And these are very old but these are very old and they're kind of filling the space of listening on something that is cheap and not forgiving. So for example, if there is harshness in my mix, it is going to really start screaming at you <laughs> with these headphones. So um, yeah, I listen on these for those reasons. Just to hear how it sounds with a very, um, you know, these can't really replicate low end very well, stuff like that. So it gives you a totally different idea of what the balance might feel like on, you know, a different device. So I listen on these to make sure it doesn't sound, mostly to make sure it doesn't sound too harsh, which I've been um, getting really lucky with lately. I haven't had to do a lot of that um, tweaking on that lately, but I'll do that. And then what I'll do is I'll bounce out the mix and I'll put it on Google Drive and then I'll access it on my phone. So I'll listen through my actual phone speakers. 
So I have, it's just like a, an Android phone, but I'll listen on my actual phone speakers to see how it feels on there. And then, you know, throughout this whole process, especially once we have bounced out and we're elsewhere, if I hear something that I don't like in the mix, something that I want to change in the mix, I will put a note down on my notes app and I'll, um, you know, I'll have that as a mix note for when we return to the studio computer to work on the mix some more. So I'll listen on my phone. And then the other thing that I'll do is I'll take it out to the car. So everyone knows the car trick, right? Um, so we listen in the car. We listen to music in the car all the time, sometimes. I haven't been driving much lately. But the idea is that you're familiar with your car sound system. So check it in your car. Check it on what you're familiar with. Because um, if you want it to stack up to other mixes that you know and love, then checking it on systems that you are familiar with will help you see how it compares with the other things that you're listening to. And then, you know, oftentimes I'll be working with a client and then we'll go listen in their car as well because they're familiar with their system and then they might add notes, for example. Um, and throughout this process, if I'm working with a client, I'll have them also listen to whatever I'm listening to, whatever system I'm listening to and see what they think. Because everyone has different ears. Everyone hears things differently. It's it, it helps, right? It helps to do this. If you can take the time, it really helps. So that's pretty much everything that I'll listen to. The only other thing that I sometimes do is I have a Bluetooth speaker that I actually use in the shower and I'll sometimes listen on that speaker as well. And then I also have a sound bar down in my house that I'll listen to, to a mix on. So yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. It's just kind of the idea that once you get to a point where you're pretty happy with your mix in the studio, it's good to go and then listen on other devices as well. So like for me, it's my speakers, my headphone collection, my phone, my car, my Bluetooth headphones, my Bluetooth speaker, um, stuff like that. It's just like whatever you can get a hold of. I also have um, a little like, it's, what is it? Like an octagon or something, a little small speaker here. Let me see. I can't grab it. It's plugged in. It won't reach. But it's a little Bang & Olufsen speaker that I'll sometimes listen to something on that as well. So so yeah, if you're working on a mix in your own setup and you're starting to feel good about where it's sitting, how it's feeling, all that stuff, I would definitely recommend taking it out into the world and trying it on a whole bunch of different systems and just listening to how, how it feels when it translates. Because not only is it a good system for refining your mix and perfecting your mix and it'll help you to bring it just like that a little bit a little bit better than it would have been otherwise, but it's also going to help you learn how your mixes translate from your space into everywhere else. So it helps you then calibrate your brain for what your setup is like. And that's really important. That can really help you improve your mixes over time. All right. I think that's it. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. So I hope that someone found this helpful, someone found this useful out there. I hope it's okay that this is, was a bit more of a brain dump. <laughs> it was just like a random um, chat kind of brain dump video. Let me know if you like this style of video. I know a lot of my videos are kind of brain dumpy, informal chat. I just kind of sit down with like two words for my plan and then I go. Um, but yeah, let me know what you think. And I guess, as always, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I'd appreciate all of that stuff. I have a Patreon, so it's patreon.com slash Noise. My patrons get access to additional content, early release videos. We have a Discord server that we're all hanging out on. It's been a lot of fun, so please feel free to check that out. And other than that, I come out with new videos every Wednesday. And thank you so much for hanging out. Okay. But I do have that weakness in my low end, so I do try to... <laughs> It just sounds, it sounds like I'm talking about my butt. Okay. I hope that wasn't too rambly. It's just, it's just the idea that it's really important to get used to whatever system you do have, right? It's just adjusting your brain to whatever system you do have. That's, that's really the core part of it, I think. I think that's the core idea there. All right. <laughs>